All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. As always, your host, Brandon Joe, my host, Nick and Dan. And gentlemen, we are here with the 2022, no, the 23-24 season. Want to start that over? I mean, I'm good, gentlemen. The point is... Well, it's, ep- it's episode 22 and episode 23. It wasn't I like actually, it was a who, script Who bomb. put 22 on the goddamn teleprompter? You know Guys, he'll read anything that's on I it. want to go back and re-predict last season so we can change what happened. I want to bury it so far underneath the ground that I, we don't ever see it again. How about that? Well, we can definitely help with that as we do the 23-24 season predictions that never go wrong or sideways. Uh, so we're going to have two parts on this one. This will be part one, uh, and then part two dropping tomorrow. So make sure to come back and check out the rest of it. Um, but you know, Dan, before we go all the way into, uh, our crystal balls, we, we do want to ask for maybe a little bit of listener support as we head into the season. Cause this is a very crucial time where new Chelsea fans are coming into the family. Well, yeah, we always appreciate people leaving yeah, there's, there's free ways to support the show, right? Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps people find the show. Go subscribe on YouTube. It's a free thing to do to help us out. Getting very close to 27,000 just a few days ago. Hit that 26,000 mark, so super appreciative there. I know people love the Matt Law video we dropped uh, earlier today here on Wednesday, August 9th, so people were really enjoying that. And then, look, Sam, CFC Central, doing a weekly newsletter now for the season dropping on Wednesdays. London is blue dot beehive b-e-e-h-i-i-v dot com you can subscribe there and get a wonderful little missive in your digital mailbox every wednesday so enjoy that and uh, look uh, patreon.com slash on the blue pod it's a financial way to support the show and you get access to our wonderful discord community and uh, make us feel good for putting out all this content and fantasy primary league starting back up baby and you know who's really good at it me tremendous at it love it uh, Dan, what is your fantasy Premier League name? Lewis Hall and Oates. Nice job. I'm uh, sorry, Nick Jackson. Ooh. <laughs> so feel pretty good about that, BB. No idea. I uh, have to decide if I'm able to commit or if I should take a season off uh, to encourage everybody else to to get to top yeah. five. I've, I've been there. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm clogging it up. He's a quitter. That's that's what we that's what we know and love. M- Years is, of domination, and then Brandon has one good season, and then this is what we get. Yeah, uh, retiring at the top of my game. No, no, no just not there yet. Uh, I'm a deadline day signing, much like uh, Chelsea at this point. So let's kick it off, gentlemen. First prediction, uh, probably the hardest prediction of them all: league performance. So first is where the hell are we going to land in the table? We did this along the live tour that we did, Nick, so I think we have a lot of data to go off of, but uh, we're saying top four, top six, top half, lower half, and uh, the listeners really aggressive here going top four with half the votes. The other half essentially top six. Yeah, they're an optimistic bunch. Um, I, I am going to, of course, be... A bit of a wet blanket here because uh, I've uh, been burned before and I don't want to be burned again. But uh, we are we are doing this, it must be said, before the transfer window closes, as we do every year. And so, uh, as you'll fondly remember, Brandon once predicted David Luiz would have the most minutes uh, in, in the team. He then was uh, uh, signed at Arsenal the next day and we all had a really fun laugh about that and haven't let him forget it. So... Um, Just remember that any and all predictions could go right into the shitter immediately. But, uh, you know, saying that and with the news this week of Nkunku's injury, without replacing his goal contributions in any way, I'm going to go top half, which is 7 to 10th. If we do replace his goal contributions, I think top six comfortably. That's kind of my rationale just with the current day's information, Dan. Yeah, I'm also of the mind that top six is how I've generally felt where Chelsea will be this season. I, I don't know when you're going from last season, 12th, point, uh, 12th position, 44 points, to saying you're going to go and get back 30 some odd points to make a top four finish. That's a really large ask. And so I'm just looking for us to get back in the top six, get back into European competition uh, or a, a 
you know, a level of European competition commiserate with Chelsea. And uh, look, that would give Pochettino an opportunity to win Europa League in the following season. So that would be an exciting thing as well. Yeah, I think the line from the club is going to be you have to hit top four. But when you look at the age of this squad, I think realistically top six and being in Europa League is is going to be where we end up. So I kind of did the math on this because the next question you asked, Dan, is total points using ranges greater than 70, 65 to 69, 60, 64, less than 60, a.k.a. 59. Um, because I wanted to make sure that my numbers were accurate here, right? So if you... If you kind of look back, top six, 62 points last season. The season before, top six was only 58 points. And then the COVID season, which we all remember so fondly, it was 65 points. And then the last real season, 1920, before that was 59 points. So it is between that kind of 60 to 65 range. What did you go with against the listeners? I don't know if it's against the listeners. I just think that we're going to be in the 65 to 69 point range. Again, that is the highest of any of us to set the stage for the predictions that you will both drop in a moment. But I think that puts you comfortably top six versus 60 to 64 is the sweating it out into the end of the season about where Chelsea are going to end up if top six does happen. But but what you're saying, Dan, is it's more of a normal Premier League season this year and not the jumbled up bullshit that it was last season where everybody who was in that like top eight kind of faltered down the stretch. And it was like, I think, would Brighton finish on 63 or something like that? 60, uh, sorry, um, last season or the season before? L- 62 season. points 62 points yeah so so what you're saying is we're gonna have more of a traditional top six that is stronger and everyone else seven and below is gonna kind of normalize that i mean it depends what that would Spur- be my- spurs and newcastle do because <laughs> those are your teams that have switched places with spurs uh in eighth and newcastle top four and look isn't arsenal just set up for a massive season over season regression I think they are just the roller coaster. Um, you know, Dan, I'm going to have a sip of bourbon to that. Um, look, uh, I, I just kind of doing the math and like, I, I was kind of with Brandon, just kind of looking at what the averages will be. My logic follows from before. If, if not, you know, replacing in Kunku's goal contributions, then we're going to be at the lowest tier, which is the 59 or lower. If we do replace them, I think we get into that. 60 and I'll actually change this on the fly that's 65 to 69 because it's probably the difference right if we assume that he was going to have 15 plus goal contributions over a season he misses at least half of the season now then I think there those goals could be the difference to like jump up two levels that's that's how real it is to me I mean it, it's a little you know, I think our audience kind of went against themselves with the voting from the previous one where they're like guaranteed top four And then they only 37% said we would get greater than 70 points, which I'm not even sure 70 points gets you in top four is like a lock. Like 71 last year with Newcastle. Newcastle was 71, United was 75, and then Arsenal was 84, and City was 89. I think it's mid 70s this year that gets you into top four. I mean, I think the low side in the last few seasons was like 68, but that was definitely an outlier and an anomaly. So yeah, I'm I'm in that 60, 64. That's 1.68 points per game, right? If you if we all kind of think about it that way, I don't think we're gonna get two plus points on average per game. So that's why I, that kind of settles there. I feel like that, uh, you know, one and a half points uh, average. I I could see that. You know, essentially winning what every other game. 69 points is 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 only 1.8. It's not that much much further down the line to bring you over to that side, Brandon. Yeah, I might I mean I maybe I'd take the bottom half of that range. Uh yeah, you know, anyways, it's it's we're shaving with stuff. Can I, can here, I but just say this happens. too? For for the first two categories, one thing that we we must note the average age of the squad is twenty three point seven years old as of recording. Okay. That old it doesn't yeah, it's it's ancient, you know, it's it's tough. But like I I don't remember a team that young ever finishing top four. I'm sure Rick Lanville could encyclopedia me right now and, and get me there, but like 
it's a it's a steep ask for you know a new manager and a relatively baby face team to go do that job and to get I think if we get in top six everyone should be very pleased with that result given how everything's kind of gone all the departures all the new blood like just I'm just throwing it out there like that's a big big ask counter argument though right is is top manager knock on wood you hope the other one is that one match a week gives you more time to prepare gives you more time to recover so there will be some some man management but heaven forbid there's a crumble with a younger squad it is tougher because they maybe haven't gone through it and seen how it's well, worked that's, that's right i mean that's the experience that we're missing though right yeah. like conte had the experience he had a bunch of 26 to 29 30 year olds this is not that so the that, other I, thing is because you're using the transfer market list of the players is that also includes players who will likely not feature this season. So Lukaku at 30, Hakim Ziyech at 30, like the average age is being buoyed up with them. And it actually is much lower when you take them out of the equation. And you can take out Lewis Hall at 18 and Gaga Slonina at 19 as well, you know, but for the most part, there's no arguing this is a young squad. I mean, we laughed later when we talk, talk, talk about young player of the season. You're like, so two-thirds of the squad? Like, wh where are we drawing the line here? Uh, because it is is young. So I'd be interested. Listeners, let us know. I mean, is, is age a bigger concern or is the bigger positive just one match a week? I think that's really kind of the two camps you can divide it on and, and see how it goes. And Poch is proven in the Premier League, which is good, but you, you just you never know with things. So uh, we'll we'll see how it runs. But we're gonna take our first ad break. When we get back, more predictions that we definitely won't regret. Starting off with silverware. So thank the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right. So domestic cup performance because there's obviously no continental cups. Uh, last season was a bag of bullshit with the double Man City draw. So instead, Dan, give us our options and what the people voted before we give the right answer. So we did do the double, win both the League Cup and the FA Cup. Very ambitious group of people thinking that that is on offer this season. Win only one, so just win one of the two cups, doesn't matter which one. Win none, but have a deep run, so into the semifinals or finals. And then win none with a shallow run where you are out before uh, or at the kind of quarterfinal stage. So our listeners felt like winning one is in the realm of possibility of 46%. A deep run was the second choice option at 39%, win the double at 9%, and then shallow run at 6%. So again, a lot of the preseason hype, vibe, energy is evident in the answers that people put out, Nick. But I know, look, are you going to be wet blanket again? Are you going to give the people some positivity? I will give the people some positivity. I will do it. Um, I know that you guys count on me for that all the time. I have to lift everybody up. It's honestly exhausting to do it, but I will I will be that guy. Uh, I think this year has Chelsea winning the Carabao Cup all over it. Um, and I, I remember there was a, an interview that we did with Matt Law. It was probably like three episodes ago where he was kind of talking about how Poch had a little bit of Mourinho in him, Brandon. And what better way to emulate the special one than to win the Carabao Cup in your first season at Chelsea? And I just, I don't know, the vibe in me is like, despite how I feel about our league table, you know, at the end, I think this team has something in it to go get it done. And it'd be important to, to win something that early with this young group. 100% mentality. Mourinho had a good play on that. Uh, he definitely sacrificed things to get that League Cup. Um, and... And it paid off, obviously, in a big way. I think Potch probably understands in hindsight. Like, they had so many chances to to do something at Tottenham. They just never did. And I bet he realizes how important those moments are and that they are fleeting. And if we can get ourselves in, that's good. I'm saying win one, right? I, win a cup. Obviously, I think the League Cup is most likely, even though City have had an absolute stranglehold on it. Like, Pep, fuck off. You won the Champions League. Go focus on things that are more important. Um, but we'll just see the draws are, at the end of the day, are the most important thing with this, which we can't control. And getting City back-to-back -back means we should walk to the semifinals. Like, the FA owes us that. <laughs> Warm balls, cold balls, figured out, like, you screwed us. It's our turn. 
Yes. Um, look, I think that we all have deep runs. I don't think we'll win one this year. Whoa. Hmm. Wet blanket, Dan. Wah, 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 wah. Well, well, we'll have to see. Um, I mean, we had the question from Mike here. says, what's the bare minimum we need to see from this t- this team? Well, we obviously talked about final table position in cup runs. But they think there's some player development to think it's a good season. I mean, it's got to be Europe and a trophy. I think that's what we said on tour, and I think we're all there. That would be a good season, maybe even boarding on great season. Maybe I mean, good I'm, season's I'm, just the top six. I, I, yeah, we've already talked about, like, the league. I think we all agree that, like, top six is kind of where we envision this season going just with everything that we've talked about, average age of the squad, players yet to be in. We'll see, right? But I think just to like break it down to a base level, Dan, what I am looking for is fun. I I think this team has all the markings of fun. Like it could be a lot of fun to to see some goals go in the back of the net again. It could be a lot of fun to see some young defenders develop throughout the season. It could be fun to see Enzo with a proper partner uh, go out and be the best version of Enzo. And so... I, that to me is what I'm looking for from this season. You know, I, I, I think I've set my expectations appropriately for what this could be, especially with the injury news this week. But I really hope that this team is fun, youthful, energetic, gives it all every week. Um, and, you know, without that midweek match, you would expect them to be shot out of a cannon on Saturdays. I think you'll get your fun particularly if the next 48 hours of 48 Hours FC just does exactly what it did on Wednesday. (laughs) I think that you will get the fun that you're looking for. I think that player development is actually the critical piece here, and it's taking some of the players that we purchased, Amedaweke and Mudrik, and turning them into a legit Premier League starter for a top four, top six team in the way that they maybe aren't currently yet or progressing someone like an Andre Santos into a starter in the Premier League. All of those would be good examples. I think if he had two or three of those in addition to a top six finish, finish, in addition to a deep cup run, like that's my minimum of like good season. Um, And then great season is like he had one trophy in there and it's, you know, top six is a great season from where we were last year. Hey, the last thing here, you talk about a young squad developing these players into top Premier League talent is a huge part of that as well, Mike, which which kind of leans us into player and in, in young player this season. So uh, last year, Tiago Silva and Lewis Hall swept the honors. Obviously a terrible season, but hey, nonetheless, they, they earned the award. So um, I went with Nkunku. I think that him coming off an injury, having some time, he's going to essentially be phenomenal the back two thirds of the season. Um, I'm like, he's that class. I think he's going to come back and run the show for Chelsea as long as he can stay healthy the rest of the season. So I will admit high risk, high reward with this one, but that's how good he is. If he stays healthy the rest of the season, everything will go through him and that will be it. I said, young player of the season's Levi Colwell. I think really just because he's going to get the most amount of minutes. I thought about going with Matawake, Nick, but I pulled back and I said, I think that just because Cole will is probably going to get more minutes and play more regularly, he'll earn it because of that. Yeah. That's the balance you kind of have to do with the, uh, with the player of the season, young player of the season, like at Chelsea right now, because we have an unfinished squad, you know, there's a lot of different players that could take minutes from other players, right? And until we get kind of that final 24, 25 man team, it's it's really hard to make this call. Boy, I like me some Nick Jackson for player of the season though. I I this this kid, man, I am so pumped about him and I I really when we signed him, I remember you know, just going like, what are we doing? You know, like what is what is going on here? He barely had a good half of the the La Liga season last year. He's not a guaranteed blah, 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 blah. And then we saw him in preseason, and I was like, the truth, man. This kid is the truth. Named my fantasy Premier League team after him, which is a high honor. Everyone knows that. And, uh, yeah, I just think in a team shorn of Nkunku's goals, his contributions could be paramount. 
And that will uh, that will mean player of the season for me because, God, if we don't see some goals go in the back of the net this year, uh, it will be a, a tough run. So uh, I will also go with Colwell, but I was very close to putting Gusto there. I, I still have questions about Reese's health, and I think Gusto is going to push him hard this year. Well, the reason that Captain Reese James is going to be the player of the season is like is due to things like load management that he will get through Malagusto being in the side, being in the squad, being able to get 20 minutes, maybe at the end of a game where we are securely on the front foot off and not be maxed out on the total minutes and contributions he has to make there. But I think just in terms of, look, he's he's put down the bags of bricks and he's going to get the team to help carry them and carry this team across the line to a top six finish. And I think he's going to get back to the goals and assists contributions that he was having in previous seasons to be a major contributor on both phases in defense and in attack. I think it's Reese James, Captain Reese James to you and everybody else. Levi Colwell for the the young player of the season. <laughs> Brief mention there. You switched yours. I know where you were, and I went with Colwell because of what you had. So I'm going to call you out for for changing. <laughs> Peer pressure. Who did you have? He had Matson. I, I think. Yeah, Whoa, Matson was a sneaky be, one. Uh, yeah. And I think Matson to me would be like the surprise. <laughs> would be like the surprise of the season <laughs> because I, I think some type of offensive like taking a guy who was a exceptional left back in the championship last season for Burnley and somehow he becomes a massive attacking contributor for Chelsea <laughs> would be the wildest thing and look I'm here for it I am here for that if it ha- if it comes off if but he has, I do if think he has 10 goal contributions he wins the young player of the season the, man like the back yes. pedaling was impressive Dan I didn't know you had that coordination in you <laughs> I, I would say about, it's all about Reese, bounce. though just to support you is um, a little thing I picked up in the one of the media spots he did was he understands he has to be healthy and on the pitch. Like, he knows that. And the fact that he said it out loud, I think, is a good sign. I hope it doesn't mean he's not going to go as hard on the pitch because he's worried about picking up a knock. But I think maybe when Matt's talked about or we've talked about diet or physios and, and recovery – Maybe that will just be an elevated part of his game when it comes to that load management, less games. Hopefully that, that'll help. I have a question, though, about his goal contribution thing that you said, though. I think he's going to be asked to do a lot more defending and a lot less Reese James activities Ooh. this year. And j- because I think, like, we saw what Malagusto had to do in preseason. That is a hard-ass job that he that he was asked to do, and he is fit, like... I think I think it may be that Reese is asked to be a little less creative and more of a facilitator than than what he was asked to do under Tuchel, which is basically be the entire offense. So, yeah. It, it, the other the other thing is that there's not necessarily a natural header of the ball in that attacking line at the moment, which probably does challenge the the assist contribution element of it. But look, we'll see. We'll see. But this is why we do the game. Because we get an opportunity halfway through the season to think about what idiots we were for selecting these options. All right, we're going to take a last ad break when we get back. Uh, who's going to score the goals? We'll find out. Think of the sponsors. We'll be right back. All right, a uh, tough one when we look at Golden Boot and assist leader last season, uh, Kai Havertz and Raheem Sterling with nine goals. Mason Mount and Raheem Sterling with four assists. Not what you really want to see from a team, but when you look back, it makes a lot of sense. So we're going to rip it up and uh, start over. So, uh, Nick, I'll let you do the honors on Golden Boot and then Assist Leader. If Nick Jackson is my player of the season, that means he is our Golden Boot winner. And so that makes just logical sense um, for where we go. If... A certain midfielder is finally signed at Chelsea, and I am able to lower my blood pressure about the midfield this season. Enzo Fernandez will lead the team in assists. We saw the sweet, sweet dimes that he dropped in a team that could not score goals last year. Wait till he does it in a team that can. Uh, Cat is going to be spraying passes all over the field, and uh, he's going to resemble more of the Enzo Fernandez that we signed than the... 
uh, John Obi Mikel look alike that he was last season at times. Dan, where are you going to so, go with yours? So I think Enzo's a good shout for the assist leader. I think that if so, this is a contingent one because I, I am putting giving myself the opportunity to say if we sign. Elise, I think he immediately would jump up to the top of my list on who would have the most assists in this side. Very creative player. I think, given my earlier statement, Reese James would still be my individual. Like, he had nine two seasons ago, and he was second only to Mason Mountain that season in terms of total contributions for assists in the, in the Premier League. I think it's likely Reese if we don't sign Elise. They were golden boot. You're not going to hear a disagreement with me from me about Jackson. I think he is the one you have to bet on being the golden boot winner for this team. You could argue that maybe Raheem Sterling finds himself back into form, but that's a, I think that's a tougher bet for me to take than betting on where Jackson is. The belief he has in himself, the way he spoke about himself in preseason, Brandon, about like, I don't just want to be as good as Drogba. I want to be better than Drogba. That is the right attitude for a striker at Chelsea. And he's going to need some service to help make it happen. But I think he's the one you have to bet on. You disagreed. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket, and that is Nkunku. Or I did say whoever has penalties. because <laughs> Well, you're, you're asking Nkunku to do a lot. Uh, I mean, we've seen him do a lot. Minus outside Get of that fit injury, in under three months. The man, the man did it all. We're at two right now. All right. We'll start there. Mm, you know, we'll see how it goes. But let's... I put my eggs in my basket. I'm sticking there. Ben Chilwell for assists. How about that? Uh, he looks fit. He looks one. strong. His runs were uh, from deep. Motson was... Uh, when he was left wing, he was playing very central. We saw Chill with a ton of space out on the left. I think that is going to give him uh, opportunity after opportunity to put the ball into a dangerous area, and we're going to have people there to finish it. So that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Can I say about Nick Jackson, who has Didn't compared you? himself to uh, to Didier Drogba, <laughs> as Dan has mentioned? Took the 15. Well, he took the 15, which is a delightful number. Um and as Drogba was 15 in his first season at Chelsea, he did have 10 goals and five assists in that first season. I think Jackson gets more. I almost, I'm shocked actually with your belief in, in Kunku, Brandon, that you didn't put him for goals and assists because I actually think that would be the super sneaky play. The triple down, baby. Let's go. Yeah. Triple down in like three months. He's going to do, do it in three months. Do it. I mean, you could, but. I'm sticking with Chile because he looks fit and ready. That's vice captain Benjamin Chilwell to you. Hey, no one's arguing. All right. Uh, what the about most champ. most improved? And uh, I like how last season you literally just left a question mark because, you know, uh, tough season. Could, could, could be anyone. Everybody. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, votes. Mikhailo Mudrik with 84%. Matawake with 10%. Gallagher 5%. And others with two. I thought this was a little bit tough on Matawake because he came in in January. Like, how does, I don't know, he improve? Maybe just a low level. Uh, Connor Gallagher, uh, he was a lightning rod of a player, Dan. Uh, but Mudrick is the overwhelming. And I, you know what I think it is, is because we've seen glimpses in preseason of what he can be. And so I think people are using that as a curve to judge last season. Yeah, I think it's also, this is the the hope award to me. It is the, I hope in our my heart of hearts that this player is going to achieve the level that I think they're possibly capable of hitting. It's the run five seasons of simulation in Football Manager or FIFA to get them up to, or get their stats up to the level you want. Mm-hmm. I, I think Matawake, or I think um, Matawake had like less than 400 minutes last season. So I, I don't think that would, to me, like, I, I think it's still like almost a first, that, that to me is a mulligan. Like, I think this, I want to judge him based upon what he contributes at the start of this season. I think that Mudrik shows a lot of promise. I think just the way he finished preseason, the fact that he was playing comfortably in a pivot with Enzo, playing back deeper, he can play forward. I think he's, Kind of a perfect player for Pochettino, and I know not everybody agrees with that. 
I think Connor Gallagher could have a massive season if he stays. And I think the caveat would be is like if so, for some reason with all these midfielders we're going to sign in the next 48 hours, whether it's Adams or Lavia or Caicedo, then, you know, maybe something random happens and he's not there and then the vote would go to Mudrick. But I think if if Connor Gallagher stays, I think he's got a, a massive potential to become uh, a real world beater under Pochettino. Uh, you know... I'm with the people on this one. Of course you are. I, of course. I, I do feel like it was, A, we didn't play to strengths, and B, it was tough. It was tough watching Mudrick in the back half of last season. I would say, Nick, though, the bottom's kind of fallen out of this award because so many players have left, right? And so the fact that you and I have players who are only there for half a season, while Dan went with Connor Gallagher, which, you know, probably is on this one because he didn't get the credit he deserved last season such a bad year um i think that's an interesting twist to to this whole situation that we have uh spinning out of last season (laughs) yeah i mean look I, i think we were all in awe of his speed when we saw him in philadelphia and you know all that sort of stuff and 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 you know in dc for a little bit but like I, I just there's something about Matawake that has just caught my eye as a as a talent. I think we're gonna end up playing against a lot of low blocks and against a lot of low blocks, Mudrick's main skill set becomes kind of null and void, right? Because you can run fast at a brick wall if you want. The only thing you hurt is yourself. Um I think the trickiness of Matawake, the dribbling ability, the ability to control touches in tight spaces, all that sort of stuff, could be a big, big weapon for us on that right hand side. And so I, you know, again, I think it's unfair to say improve for for two January signings from last year. Um, you know, but I think as far as like the Hope Award goes, I just I love me some Matawake, man. I think he's special. I look. I'm up. It's a little bit of a bummer. He picked up the knock in the in the in the U21 World Cup this summer because I would have loved to see him this preseason. Right? We didn't get to see him at all. I'm excited though. The sentiment around him seems to be really positive going into the season, Nick. And he was so crucial for that England run. You know, they 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 won it, didn't they? Yeah, it turns out, yes, they actually cool. did win that. Yep, Up US, until his yep. knock, you know, he was playing a ton of minutes. And uh, so I think that's a, that's a really big, uh, you know, positive mark in his lane. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited to see what Mato AK has to cook as well. Uh, I don't know. any Anything that you guys need to go back and change now that we've gotten to the end of this part one? Uh, any redos? Uh, obviously, Dan already switched one. Do we... We, oh no, we, we haven't got we haven't done comeback player of the year. That was that was set in this oh, one, not I in the second half. Moved. All right. All right. We've got can't take Brandon anywhere. Year. It's just unbelievable. Look, there are a lot of moving pieces this one. Uh great. Comeback player of the year. Uh Cucarella, Broya, Sterling, other on the Twitter poll. Broya getting 48%, Sterling getting 29%, and Cucarella getting 12%. Are you were you were you teasing the fans a little bit here with these options, Dan? Or are you poking the bear? Oh, yeah, Dan. I, I think maybe I mean, I think maybe young Ishan made some adjustments to my suggestions because I did not have Kukare in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually uh, I did have Sterling though. I, I actually thought Reese James could be a consideration. Chilwell could be another consideration. There's a lot of players who do not have a great season last year relative to where we believe their past performances would indicate that they are a much better player than they showed off last season. Again, a lot of extenuating circumstances. So this is always like the potentially they were injured, they weren't always available. I mean, it's very similar to like the the way the NFL has like a comeback player of the year in in America that you, it really is usually won by somebody who was injured for a portion of the season last year and didn't get an opportunity. But, you know, again, you can make up your own definition. I'm fine. You know who's... Not on this list because they had a great season last year, Nick. Who? I don't know if you heard, but Keppa had a pretty good season. So it makes sense he's not on this list. Uh, As as Keppa said in a couple different press conferences, he's having a great year. He's pretty happy with himself. Loving my performances. Yeah. So instead, we we have to look elsewhere. And um, look, 
as a fellow ACLer, Broya is going to be the man. Uh, he was starting to get minutes. Bummer that he went down when he did in that friendly against Villa. It wasn't in that warm training camp that they had, kind of post World Cup. Like he was just on a good trajectory. So I'm hoping he comes back. He's able to relieve Nico Jackson, um, even though that guy's never going to want to come off. I hope he can play 15, 20 minutes, pick up the cup game, and uh, show us what he's got. I still remember the glimpses in Southampton. There's a player in there. Let's see it. So uh, just mainly for the injury, the massive injury, I'm hoping that he is uh, a comeback player of the year. Uh, there's really only one choice here and I think I've nailed it. And that is one Benjamin Chilwell, uh, a player who was injured for most of the last season dealt with a ton of issues coming back and training and all sorts of stuff does not look to be injured so far this season, which is very helpful. Uh, I think per Brandon's note above, uh, if you follow the logic pattern and he says that Chilwell's going to have the most assists on the team. That would be an automatic win uh, for a comeback player of the season. Uh, he's also now vice captain, and I think that's a responsibility he probably takes very seriously. So uh, when Benjamin Chili Chilwell is my uh, vice captain, Benjamin Chili Chilwell to you, Dan, uh, is my comeback player of the season. That was a cold response for a cool player, but I think ultimately... I'm going to go back to Reese James because while you say that Benjamin Chilwell was out injured for a lot of last season, he actually played across all competitions and the Premier League more minutes than Reese James did last year. This is not a, a competition to see who was injured more, Dan. I, I, I know it's not, but I think it's a, it, it sets a predis, uh, it basically sets the precedent for why you have an opportunity to come back because when you only play 1400 minutes total across all competitions and you play even less than that in the Premier League and have the lowest amount of senior team minutes you've had that if you were then to go and multiply it by two and a half you get back to the 3000 minute total which is where absolutely he should be aiming for this season getting back in double digit goals and assist I think it's all this is the season of Reese James. Like I, I am just, I am all in, all chips in the middle of the table on Reese James being the driving force for getting this Chelsea team back to where he need to be. So yeah, comeback player of the season, leading assist, yeah, player of the season. Let's go, all in, all in on Reese James. Oh, heavy, heavy is the head that wears the crown there, Dan. That's a. There's 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 a lot going on in your prediction. I mean, it's it's not like betting that Nkunku is going to win the Golden Boot after only being available for three months of the season, but it's still a bold strategy. Well, I think we'll see how it plays out. I think part partly there too is like Dan's just making up multipliers to to fit his argument as well. So uh, <laughs> look, he would never do that. I bet you That's make not a who great Dan is. business case Mass for everything. Crazy stuff. The ROI metrics are off the charts. All we need is that two point five multiplier, and we are printing uh. money, Jeff. <laughs> uh, all right. Hey, anything you want to go back now and and retract, change? Otherwise, we're gonna stamp and steal this one uh yeah i i mean it's just this this damn inkunku thing has screwed everything up for you it's a bummer i'm good <laughs> i gotta figure it out or for you <laughs> I, i'm good and some of you may be confused do i know he's injured i do he's that good wow backpack okay. backpack time all right well that's gonna wrap up part Stamp one it, seal it Publish it. Don't worry. We got plenty coming at you in part two. Even the Lone Star and Most Minutes Played, my favorite award ever. So uh, we'll catch you on part two. But until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.